Strategies used to protect data. Part 1. Password protection, biometrics, multi-factor authentication and permissions. So a combination of security strategies are required in order to protect data stored on systems. In this section, we'll take a look at strategies that protect data from being accessed by unauthorized users on a system or network. So essentially, they check who's coming into a network and say whether or not they have the right to access information. So what tools can we use to do that? Well, the first one is that of password protection. A password is a secret word or string of characters made up of a combination of letters, symbols and numbers. Passwords are entered on a login screen along with a username to authenticate a user accessing a system. So it helps identify essentially who they are that is entering the network and whether or not they're allowed to view specific information stored on that system or network. Now, with passwords, there's a variety of elements related to them. And by balancing these elements and including them, we can include what's known as strong passwords for users, which are harder for malicious entities to guess in order to get unauthorized access to a network. These areas related to password strength include complexity, which means that they use a combination of upper and lowercase characters, numbers and symbols within their specific password string in order to make it harder to guess and make it less like a word that could be possibly guessed by an unauthorized party. Another area is that of change frequency, that the password must be changed every three months or every six months or annually. Obviously, the more often it's changed, the better it is in case there has been a leak of passwords and then that person knows how to guess them. And then with that is whether or not passwords can be reused. So I've had this password for three months. I've now changed it to another password. Then after three months, can I change back to that original password? And in many cases, no. All right, we want to keep using different passwords. And obviously this is very hard for users because often they have many passwords for many different types of accounts. But if we're going to keep data safe, we need those passwords changing, hard to guess, and obviously being unable to be reused on multiple occasions because likely that makes them easier for a malicious entity to guess what they are. The second category is that of biometrics. A system may require the entry of a biometric data for users to gain access. What is biometric data? Well, it's obtained from a user's biology, such as their thumbprint or the scanning of and use of facial recognition software. So it's actually looking at the person's body parts. All right, so they use a thumbprint scanner to gain access to a system such as mobile phones have where they, you could rest your thumbprint on it and it would open up, as well as face facial recognition where the camera scans your face and then it unlocks a device that you're trying to get into. Biometric elements are obviously very specific to individual users. Not many people have the same thumbprint or face, so it makes them extremely hard to replicate. So they're a great way to authenticate who a person specifically is when trying to access a system or network. The third category is that of multi-factor authentication or MFA. MFA requires users to authenticate themselves using either two methods, which is two-factor authentication or 2FA or more multi-factor authentication sources of information. So this process may include users entering in their login details to access a website as the first method. So they're doing traditional password protection, your login and password, and that is the first level of authentication. Then once they've done that, they are either being sent an email or SMS message that includes a PIN as the next form of authentication. And so they get that PIN and on the next screen, they read that PIN that they got from their email or SMS message and enter that in on the next level of authentication in order to then eventually enter the system. So they've had to go through two processes there, entering in two uh, forms of identification um, from different data sources in order to authenticate who they are. So that's at a two-factor level. But if there are even more levels involved, then it'll be a multi-factor level because then they've had to give more than two. But essentially, it's really cutting down who this person is and specifying who they are because someone might have obtained their login details, such as their login and password, and entered them in. But then once that SMS message is sent to the user's device, then they know someone's trying to hack their account and get into it. So it kind of almost notifies them that someone's trying to get into their account and they can't do it because they're not getting the pin for their next level authentication because that's being sent to the user's device, even though this person may know their login or password. 
So that's the strength of multi-factor authentication. And then the final category that may be linked to these methods of authentication, essentially because it's linked to a person's account, is that of permissions, which need to be established in order to determine which users of an organization have the right to view specific information. So it's one thing to be an authenticated user and access a system, but then it's another thing to be able to see all the data within that system. And essentially, these logins and accounts should be mapped to specific users and what their specific work tasks are within an organization, not just for maintaining privacy, but also controlling who can do what with data. So these authenticated users will be given permissions on what they can actually do with that data. So I might have a right to see lots of records within the data of a specific system, but I mightn't have the right to edit those records. So there is an editing privilege that says a certain level of authentication that might be assigned to managers, they can edit these records. But for everyone else, it's read only. And it's only for specific members of a specific department. For these read only uh, permissions, certain amounts of those people might be able to comment on the records, which means they can't change the records, but they can give suggestions. And then those with very high level permissions, which might be higher end upper management type staff, only they have the ability to share information. And obviously that needs to be kept very small in who has that access right, because that's how information can be leaked or shared with the wrong parties. All right, so very few would have that permission to be able to actually share data based on its privacy and PII on who can see it and really trying to limit what they can do with it, okay? So permissions do need to be established that are specific to workers' job roles within an enterprise. So I hope this video has given you a bit of an understanding of some strategies used for protecting data within the context of or authenticating users and their access to a system or network. That of password protection, where we have a login and a password that is a string of characters that is used to authenticate a user's login. Biometrics, which makes use of a person's biology, their thumbprint or their face that allows them to gain access to a network when scanned. Multi-factor authentication, which obviously takes in a user's password, but then asks them to authenticate again using a PIN that might be sent to their email or SMS or both, okay, in order to gain multiple levels of authentication to actually enter a system. And then permissions, allowing users to authenticate themselves, but assigning them different levels of permissions, whether to be able to edit data, to read only data, to comment data or share data with others based on their specific level of their job role within an organization.